Thank you everyone. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, research that I'm conducting here at La Trobe, which is on the very early detection and diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders, so under three years of age. So before I go on to talk about um, my type of research on early identification and diagnosis, I just want to um, talk about what autism is. So autism spectrum disorders are characterized by two broad areas. So individuals with autism have deficits in social interaction and communication skills. So they find it uh, difficult to communicate in everyday situations and to understand nonverbal and verbal cues, for example. They also have repetitive or stereotyped behaviours. Stereotyped behaviours are things like flapping your hands or walking up on your tiptoes and sensory behaviours and interests. So having an aversion to things such as bright lights or sounds or preferring sensory input like deep pressure. Autism affects one in every 100 people. And these individuals are our friends, our family, our colleagues, our neighbours. And autism doesn't discriminate. It affects all classes and races equally. But what we do know is that autism does affect more boys than girls. So that with every one boy, um, with every one girl diagnosed with autism, three to four boys are diagnosed with autism. Although there's no cure for autism, um, early detection and diagnosis leads to early intervention. And the reason why early intervention is so important is because it capitalises on brain plasticity. So the young developing brain is easily changed in very, very early years and in fact the early months of life. So we want to be able to capitalise on this early brain plasticity and try and move the child towards a more typical developmental trajectory. And not only does it, does it um, early intervention improve outcomes for children and lead to um, better developmental outcomes in the future for them as adults, it actually um, reduces family stress on the unit as a whole because parents are able to begin seeking services for themselves and counselling and begin that adjustment period that follows an early uh, diagnosis. And most importantly, we can actually tell tell parents and inform them that it's not anything that they are doing that is causing their child to have these developmental difficulties. Autism is a neurobiological disorder that is highly heritable. And so heritable, in fact, that siblings have a greatly increased risk of having autism themselves. So in fact, um, the recurrence rate for autism in siblings is 20% rather than the 1% prevalence rate in the general population. Now, we know through the literature that there are early flags of autism, and my research at La Trobe has also uh, identified these early red flags and early markers of autism. So these um, deficiencies or these deficits fall mainly in the social attention and communication realm. So for example, children with autism have difficulties or deficits in eye contact, whether it's reduced eye contact or it's not very frequent or it's not modulated with gestures and vocalisations, for example. They have difficulty in responding to their name. And parents often um, tell me that one of the first things they thought was that their child was actually hearing impaired. But we actually then found out after hearing tests that in fact it was a, a lack of response to the actual, the child's name rather than sounds in general. They also have decreased use of gestures like pointing. So when we point to things, we want to show people things, we want to draw their interest, we want to draw um, them into our world and say, hey, look, you know, that's really interesting. And children do that all the time. Typically developing children, you see them, you take them to the park and they're pointing to things everywhere. Children with autism very rarely engage in these types of behaviours. Also other gestures like waving, nodding, shaking your head, but gestures that you use to communicate, children with autism um, find very difficult to do. Very typical behaviours like showing. When children get new toys, the first thing they want to do is show their parents, hey, look at this new toy. And children with autism very rarely do that also.
They're all, they also have deficits in imitation, so copying other people, in pretend play, feeding a teddy, giving a teddy a drink, and in what we call joint attention behaviours. So joint attention behaviours is um, when you share attention between a person's face and the environment. So I look at you and then I look over there and I look back at you. So it's flicking your attention between people and the environment. And although children, um, although some infants and toddlers do have um, deficits or difficulties in terms of having repetitive behaviours, stereotype behaviours and sensory behaviours, these can be very subtle in the very early years and are, and are extremely varied. So we can't actually use these as red markers, although they may be present. So we really focus on social attention and communication red flags. So what I'd like to show you are some videos of a child with autism and a child without autism so that you can see the difference between these children at a very young age. So this video is of a boy called Jaden. He was part of my research, which I'll talk about in a minute in the social attention and communication study. We diagnosed Jaden with autism at 18 months of age. And here is a video um, of him not responding to his name. Jaden. Jaden, so you can see him calling Jayden. his name multiple times. And he's very, very focused on his own activities. Usually when you call a child's name, they'll look on the first or second call. Then we look at this second video of Jaden. I'm really trying to get his eye contact so I can see if he has joint attention. I'm going to point to something. I want to see, can he follow where I'm pointing to? No eye contact there, very focused on the object, trying to get the object, trying to get his eye contact, and he's very focused on this door. And he really doesn't understand the concept of what I'm trying to do, which is to get him to look where I'm pointing. He's focusing instead on the, my hand and on the, the blocks in front of him. So then when we um, compare Jaden to a typically developing 18 month old, you'll see the, the enormous difference between these two children. So this is Isabella and I am um, seeing how she responds to my joint attention vids. Isabella. Wow. So you can see lovely joint attention there. Focusing Isabella, the look. on my face. Look. Turning and looking. As soon as I turn my face, she's following my gaze. Isabella, look! Look! It's over there. Look! And she's also looking quite puzzled because I'm actually not <laughs> pointing to anything. And so it, that's actually a good thing because she's looking at my face and she's like, yep, I'm looking, but what are you trying to tell me? So she's getting a lot of information from my face um, and from my gestures. And then when we look here at her use of gestures, you'll see here that she does lots of pointing and lots of referencing with me. So many bubbles. <laughs> So gestures there, you got clapping, for joy. Bubbles. That's it. Bubbles. Very and again, good, some darling. very beautiful behaviours there. You've got pointing, you've got gestures, you've got eye contact, you've got vocalisations, bubbles, and she's combining them all together. And they're the three behaviours that we really focus on together. If a child is doing this, then they are um, at greatly reduced risk of um, having an autism spectrum disorder. So despite knowing the um, red flags of uh, autism, um, there, are, um, there are no screening tools that we can actually use to effectively identify children with autism under two years of age. And so we don't have any tools that we can use for universal screening. And the reason for this is because a screening tool is usually administered at one point in time. So you're actually missing opportunities to try and identify that child at a later point in time. And also the majority of screens are actually based on parental questionnaires. Now this can be problematic because parents may not be aware of what developmental milestones their child should be reaching, especially if it's their first child. And so we can't expect parents to be able to correctly respond in terms of a questionnaire if they're not quite sure what they really should be looking for. And so um, 
what we should be doing is moving away from a screening model of autism and towards a surveillance model of autism, where you are repeatedly monitoring children over the first two years of life. And this is um, done with uh, professional observations. So healthcare professionals that have been trained on the early signs of autism. So I therefore um, conducted a large scale developmental surveillance study because I knew that screening tools didn't work. And this study was known as the Social Attention and Communication Study or the SACS. And this was part of my PhD that I conducted here at La Trobe in 2006. And this, um, the study was actually the most successful sc screening and surveillance study of its kind in the world. Because what we did is we monitored 22,000 babies in their maternal and child health um, setting. So during routine checks from 8 to 24 months of age. So nurses were trained on the early signs and they were uh, trained to look for these early red flags. Of all the children monitored, 1% were identified as at risk, which is actually the prevalence rate for autism. So we felt that we were, real, we were really on the ball with that. Of all the children that came to see us, 81% met criteria for an autism spectrum disorder, which was the best figures, which were the best figures of its kind. The, the next best um, tool actually only identified correctly 11% of children. And importantly, we had a sensitivity of 84%. So that means that of all the children that had autism in that larger sample, we identified 84% of them. So these are the, um, the best psychometric properties that we've, that we've uh, so far encountered in the literature on early screening and surveillance. And nurses felt that it, in it greatly increased their knowledge of the early signs of autism and their confidence in being able to identify and refer children if they had concerns. They often say, mm, I felt that there was something not quite right, but I wasn't sure what it was. But after this training, I knew exactly where to refer. Also, parents were able to receive a diagnosis for their child much earlier than was typically the case. So prior to 2006, having a child diagnosed with autism under the age of three was almost unheard of. It really was very, very rare for this to occur prior to this time. So based on these results, we've opened up an early assessment clinic here at La Trobe University, in which I'm the lead clinician in. And so we see children from um, three years of age and under for an autism assessment. And we've had large demand for the, the, um, the rollout of the study and the surveillance in other countries. So we have disseminated and translated this tool uh, in Poland, in Japan, in South Korea, in Bangladesh, and most recently in China. And the exciting thing about our most recent trip is that Tianjin in China, the government has actually um, agreed to roll out our surveillance study over the next seven years for every single baby uh, that is born in Tianjin. So that's 100,000 babies being monitored for autism every single year. So it's very exciting times and the impact that something like this can have um, in developing as well as developed countries is enormous. What we're also doing is as part of the Autism Cooperative Research Centre for Living uh, with Autism Spectrum Disorders, um, La Trobe is an essential partner in this and we are going to um, roll out the SACS across four states in Australia and it's part of a national collaboration on the early identification and the early diagnosis of autism. And we are currently rolling out a revised version of the SACS in Victoria currently and so far the results are even more promising than the first study. Study. And in fact, we have an 88% accuracy rate for autism. So all children that are referred, 88% actually do have autism. So um, we're, we're able to refine and improve our methodology with every study that we conduct. So ultimately, my big fat idea is to transform the way that we identify autism and the way that we diagnose autism. And, the, and what we need to do is do it early because we know that early intervention for children maximises their potentials. So we need to have a look at 
at it broadly. We need to have a public awareness campaign on the early signs of autism and on autism in general so that we can, um, we can decrease the stigma surrounding the word autism. We know that children's outcomes are greatly improved with early intervention and that individuals can lead independent lives in the future. Um, just, just because they have autism, it does not mean that they can't live a leading, uh, a fulfilling life and be productive you know, members in society. So uh, we also need to educate parents on the very early signs of autism so that when um, healthcare professionals raise concerns with them, they're more receptive to receiving um, that information and they're also more likely to, re to um, raise concerns themselves. We also want to make delivering an autism diagnosis to parents easier. So we want to establish a clinic where we can counsel parents after an early diagnosis. And ultimately, we want to increase um, awareness of autism in general. We want to decrease the age at which we diagnose autism so that we can maximise potentials for children and reduce stress on the family unit. So I'd like to show you um, a video of Jaden, who was diagnosed at 18 months of age, who you saw before. And this is uh, his outcome at three years of age. Mommy, yes. What should we do now? At birthday. Yeah, you ready? At so he was non-verbal yeah. at two. two and this is at three and he's at talking, birthday. singing. Happy he's making nice eye contact with the examiner <laughs> in anticipation. <laughs> Hooray! 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 He's sharing Hooray! affect with the examiner and he's engaging in pretend play which he wasn't able to do at um, 18 months and 2 years of age either. Yay! So this is really the best outcome that we can expect for children like Jaden and we want to have these outcomes for all children with an autism spectrum disorder. Thank you.